Welcome to our video on funicular shape for an arch under the primary load. The funicular shape is defined under a given load as the proper shape for the structural element so that it will be acting in pure compression and have no bending. In this particular video, we're going to do an overview of common shapes that people are inclined to try to use for arches and how some of them work well and some of them don't under various circumstances. So here we see uh, three curvilinear shapes which are candidates for arches. One is a semicircle, so it is half of a circle and its center is right here. So the rise of these arches is half of the span in this case because that's imposed by the fact that we're choosing to look at a semicircle. Um, in the same diagram, we're showing a catenary uh, and a parabola. So let's talk about what those things might be. The appropriate shape for a catenary is very challenging to compute. It involves a transcendental equation, which has to be solved numerically. Of course, with modern computers, that can be done fairly simply, but it's still is a multi-step process that's more complicated than most of the other forms that we're going to deal with. That will be a subject of a later video. Um, to be honest, we rarely do a catenary form, so many of you will be satisfied to just have a general sense of what that word means, uh, and so you won't use it incorrectly and leave an incorrect impression with someone with whom you're having a conversation, such as your engineer. Um, while computing the coordinates of cat catenary is very challenging, it is very easy to generate a catenary experimentally. A chain or rope draped between two support points takes on the shape of a catenary. So in this case, we're looking at a heavy-duty bicycle chain, which is supported at this point and that point, and it's assuming this shape under its own weight. We can take that mathematically and flip it upside down. And in fact, um, this I just flipped this photograph for the purpose of this particular lecture. Uh, this chain cannot be turned upside down, or excuse me, it can be, and it will have the perfect form to support its own weight as an arch in compression. However, since it has many hinge points, it will typically collapse if disturbed even slightly. In the case of this chain, the slight friction of all the joints did allow us to turn it upside down and have it support itself. Uh, we had to try to do that several times and we had to be incredibly del delicate with it because otherwise it would immediately collapse. If we glued the joints while it is hanging in the correct shape, then it would make a very good arch when turned upside down, such as this image shows here. <clears throat> Of course, we do not typically build buildings that way, so we are going. if we're going to build an arch in the shape of a catenary, we would have to do the math for the catenary and have the means to facilitate uh, fabricating an arch to that shape. The load on this arch is not as uniform along the length of the arch. In other words, all these links are the same length and they're the same weight. So it's uniform along its length but not uniform is projected down to the horizontal. So in the center here, we have constructed two lines which both start at one of the pins, this pin in this link and that pin in this link. And we projected them down to the horizontal. And now we're going to say within that length along the horizontal, we have the equivalent weight of one link one link per that unit of length. Then we've copied these two lines and without changing their spacing, we move them up here over to the left near the support point. And now we see we're going from that pin to the link in the next pin to the link in the next pin. So in other words, we have twice as much chain along that length from right there to right there as we do from right here to right there, but the horizontal spacing is the same. 
So in other words, we have twice as much load per unit length along the horizontal at near the support point as we have at the center. So again, as we project the load on the horizontal, it is twice as high near the supports as it is at the center of the arch. If this arch was taller, that difference would be much more dramatic. If this arch was much shallower, that difference would not be nearly so dramatic. If this structure was made out of concrete and was very heavy compared to any snow load that might accumulate it on it, then the appropriate shape for this arch would be a catenary. The thickness of the slab roof is uniform along the length of the member or along the structure, and the arch is uniform along the arch or along its axial, axial dimension. Snow load would not be uniform along the length of the arch. Snow comes down uniformly along the horizontal. If the structure above was made of lightweight metal construction and existed in locations where the snow load um, was significantly larger than the dead weight of the structure, then the appropriate shape of the arch would be closer to a parabola than to a catenary. And we'll talk about what a parabola and what a catenary is, um, but I'm just going to give you a few examples here, and then we're going to show you the shape, and at some point we'll get into the mathematics. The Broadgate Exchange House is an example of a structure within which the load is predominantly uniform along the horizontal. The arches in this building weigh less than 2% of the load they're carrying. And the load, by the way, consists of uh, roughly 10 floors of uniformly distributed floor slab, uh, floor beams, and live loads, which actually are comparable to or larger than the floor dead loads. So we have all this, which is uniform along the horizontal. It gets accumulated into these vertical elements, which are uniformly spaced and they load the arch at these key vertex points, which are also spaced uniformly along the horizontal. The uniform loads on the floor are drastically larger than the self-weight of the arch. Therefore, to first order, we ignore the self-weight of the arch and focus on the other loads, which are uniform as projected on the horizontal. In this case, these floor loads, as we said, are delivered to the arches at these joints, which are uniformly spaced along the horizontal. When we show subsequent videos, the appropriate shape for the arch is proven to be a parabola and not a catenary. So if we compare those two for a moment, the parabola is the right shape for the uniformly distributed load, but the catenary has more load near the end and it's expressing that by bulging outward and engaging that larger load. From a sort of visual point of view and an aesthetic point of view, we can say the catenary tends to be a bit fuller than the parabola. The parabola tends to be a little flat in here, and the parabola and the catenary bulges out somewhat more. Um, from a structural point of view, the semicircle is not nearly as good. It's a very full form, and for aesthetic reasons, some people might like it, but from a structural point of view, it's way off the mark. For shallower structures, we can rescale the semicircle to form an ellipse. An ellipse is basically a squash down or re rescaled circle. So this circle right here, when we compress it downward, becomes this ellipse. And then again, we have the parabola. We can rescale a parabola. The mathematics of parabolas are wonderfully simple. Y is equal to kx squared. Um, when you scale it, you're just changing the constant of proportionality k, but you're not changing it from being a parabola. Um, the catenary is more challenging. If we scale a catenary, it is no longer a catenary. We have to recalculate the catenary every time that we change the rise, and the mathematics of the catenary is much more complicated to calculate than for the parabola.
So we wish we could just scale the catenary and then do something with the parabola because calculating the catenary is such a, a pain. But this is the reality that we have to deal with. There is a fourth common form for shallow structures, which is the arc of the circle. So here you see that this outer solid uh, curve is an arc of a circle, and we could get its center by projecting a line down here and projecting a perpendicular, and the center of this appears to be here or maybe slightly below the, the edge of the screen. The arc of the circle is very easy to create in a fabricational way. Um, unfortunately, arcs of circles cannot be scaled. A rescale arc of a circle is no longer an arc of a circle. The arc of the circle has to be recalculated every time we change the rise. However, the mathematics of the arc of a circle is not nearly as challenging as the mathematics of a catenary which is really nice because we can make uh, arcs of circles by rolling metal shapes, for example, and they're pretty easy to make. And so it's nice to know that we don't have that very complex mathematics of the catenary every time we do it. Okay, the appropriate shape for this arch under its own weight, which is uniform along its length, would be a catenary. However, catenaries and parabolas are fairly similar in shape, as you could see from our previous drawings. Um, and we were being a little lazy, so to facilitate making this demonstration fairly quickly, we made this in the shape of a parabola. Notice there was some centering here, and that centering was what this parabola got assembled on top of, and then the centering got dropped down. And you'll notice that the parabola is standing under its own self-weight um, after the centering has been dropped. The parabolic arch of this configuration also demonstrates the property of self-restoration. We could repeatedly press the structure inward here until we reach the limit as set by the centering and when we let go, it would snap back to its original shape. So its, its shape is self-restoring within limits, obviously. If we'd push it too far, it would have collapsed. But when we would play with this arch, we got a pretty high level of confidence that it made sense as the structural form. And we also had a high level of confidence that with a very heavy, massive material like stone, uh, that we could probably build an arch that would easily resist the wind load and and not collapse. <clears throat> this is a semicircular arch which has the same cross section and the same span as the parabolic arch we were just looking at. As with the case of the parabola, parabola the various pieces of the arch were put together in alignment by assembling the arch on the top of the centering material. And we didn't show that process for the parabolic, but we're showing it here. So here we have our centering material. Here we have the pieces of the arch put on top of it. And now in this image, we see the centering material beginning to be dropped down. This shape is so bad for this application that the structure was not stable at all, as demonstrated by the deformations occurring as the centering was being lowered. Continuing to lower the centering led to the complete collapse of the structure. In other words, it could not support itself um, with this particular shape. <clears throat> for centuries, Romanesque churches were built with semicircular arches. This was done for spiritual reasons, since Christians believed that the circle was the most perfect form and therefore the most appropriate form for building God's house. Clearly, it is not the most perfect form for an arch. What made the, Ro the Romanesque churches work for centuries was the non-uniform load and the wedging material. So when I say non-uniform, we have less load here than we have over here. But also we have material that has been wedged in. So the tendency of this arch to bulge outward 
is inhibited by compressive forces that go through this material to the next arch. So the two arches are trying to bulge towards each other and there's compression material in between that's tending to inhibit that. However, under seismic disturbances, the stones get shaken around and in the process, they reveal how they are actually working or not working as the case may be. Here we can trace a stress path that is much more like a parabola. So we start here and we know we have compression at the bottom, but then the only place that any compressive stress or force is being transferred is right here because it's cracked open there. There's no continuity of the material. So we have a compressive line that goes through here, up here, and then goes to the top of the arch here because we have a cracking down here, which has eliminated any kind of force transfer there. So the shape goes here, up there, comes back down here, and then to there. And if we trace that and draw it properly, we see something buried within the semicircle that looks a lot like a parabola. Uh, the semicircle, part of the reason it even worked at all is that it's deep enough that that stress path could exist there um, even when it was a circular shape. But once it gets shaken around, it reveals that that system is not working very well. The designers of Gothic cathedrals addressed this issue using Gothic arches, which are formed of two arcs of circles arranged in a manner that has a point at the top, but more specifically, it begins to mimic a bit more the shape of a parabola or a catenary. In a later video, we'll discuss Gothic arches and a variety of structural techniques that were used in Gothic cathedrals. Here's another example, by the way, as people removed uh, stonework from the, uh, the Colosseum in Rome, these arches failed to be properly buttressed. And you'll notice again an effect to tend to bulge outward at the quarter points and collapse inward at the center point. Now, we can do semicircular structural elements out of modern materials that can resist both compression and tension. And steel would be an example. So if we go back to this example, what we realize is this structure needed some tensile material there and some tensile material there and some tensile material out here where, where the significant cracking is occurring. Then this structure would have had the bending strength to sustain itself because there is a tendency towards bending in this structure. It's not all axial compression. In the case of this structure, this tensile material on the bottom of these trusses near the center is keeping the center from collapsing inward. And then the tendency to bulge outward is being inhibited by the tensile stresses or forces in the top cord on the outside of the structure. So what that means is you can have a shape like this, and even though it's not the perfect shape structurally, it can still be very efficiently made in modern materials, and it can have the shape you want it. And in some ways, the semicircular is, shape is more appealing because if it was parabolic, this would be sloped inward more, which would be inhibiting the use of the space more. And from a spatial point of view, this is probably a better shape. So we're going to explore a series of shallow arches and deep arches for a variety of shapes using computer simulations. In later videos, we will develop the analytic tools for form finding, which will enhance the depth of our understanding and help us to understand why we would want to go in certain directions. But for the moment, we're just going to pick some of these shapes and we're going to let the computer do the work for us. So here we have a series of elements which I'm calling an arch frame, which is kind of contradictory terminology, but it sort of has an arch shape. We're going to assume that whatever buttressing force it needs, it will have at the base. 
Um, but we also know that some of these forms are probably going to have very large bending stresses. So I really want to call them arch frames also. So here we have parabolas here, an arc of a circle here, and here we have a semicircle and an ellipse. So these columns in a way are labeled so we know what they are. Each of these things is spanning 80 feet and it's made out of a six by six by one eighth inch hollow steel square tube. Um, the load for each of these is uniform along the horizontal. And it's taken to be one kip per foot. So that's what that looks like when it's done graphically, like so. Now, we're going to do the computer analysis to determine the axial stresses and the bending stresses in this structural element. And you'll notice, in this case, axial stress is rendered as yellow. For the very deep arch, we have very little stress at the top, just the horizontal force, and the horizontal force is not too large because we have this wonderful lever arm for the action of the horizontal force, which is the rise of the arch. The horizontal, the uh, total axial force is larger near the base because there we have a vertical component. And in fact, the vertical component is bigger than the horizontal. So we have a pretty substantial force at that point compared to what we have up here. On the other hand, for the shallow parabola, we have more uniform but also substantially higher forces and relative to axial forces by the way the forces in the shallow parabola and the shallow uh, arc of a circle are almost identical and in fact if we go back for a second the shape of this parabola and the shape, shape of this circle are really hard to distinguish unless you lay them on top of each other at which point you see that the arc of a circle is a bit fuller near the quarter points and the parabola tends to be a little shallower or flatter in those points but there's not a great deal of difference and so it doesn't surprise us that these axial stresses in the arc of a circle are very similar to the axial stresses in the parabola when we look at a semicircle we see a pattern pretty similar to this pretty small forces at the top slightly somewhat larger forces at the bottom but still, because the semicircle is very tall, it has much lower axial forces than these shallower things, such as the arc of the circle or the shallow parabola. The ellipse is a little odd because um, it's much shallower and we'd expect axial forces more comparable to this. But there's a reason that we're going to discover very shortly why that happens. But these are relatively small axial forces. Now we're going to go down and we're going to look, you know, I should say axial stresses. Now we're going to look at bending stresses, which are a measure of how far we are deviating from a proper arch. If we have lots of bending stress, we've utterly fa failed to meet our or achieve our original intention, which is to pick the right shape. We can look at this really closely, but basically the bending stresses either in the deep parabola or the shallow parabola are relatively small. They're barely visible here in this simulation. We're starting to get some significant bending stresses in the case of an arc of a circle. So they're not huge, but this bending stress is starting to be comparable to that axial stress. So we would say, actually, for this arc of a circle, it's, it's like 50% arch and 50% um, frame or, or bending member. Um, <clears throat> we can take care of this whole problem, by the way, if we turn this into a bow truss, because then all those web members will help to stabilize that top cord. It won't be able to change shape in a way to develop any of these bending stresses. On the other hand, there will be some axial forces in those web members.
pretty minor, but some, which has to be accounted for. Where this di diagram gets really interesting, in fact, I'd say horrifying, is when we look at bending stresses. Look at this enormous bending stress compared to that axial stress. It's totally off the charts. Uh, what that says is the semicircle is really not acting much like an arch. It's actually acting more like a frame. And it has very large bending stresses. And in fact, the bending stresses in all these members are all shown sort of on top of each other, but they're all comparable in magnitude to that. So the tendency of this to sag downward in the center and induce bending stresses here is about comparable to the tendency of this to bulge outward, which is creating these huge bending stresses, which in this case just are rendered on the other side and they're all lying on top of each other. Uh, we have a similar situation. The ellipse has enormous bending stresses due to the tendency to sag down in the middle. It has a huge tendency to bulge outward which is also inducing huge amounts of bending stress. When we look at the deformations, we see essentially no deformation in the parabola. We see a little bit, but it's actually hard to discern because this simulation was all done, all these simulations in one file. And what Multiframe does in computing this graphic output is it takes the worst deformation, which might be right here, it tries to make that visible, very visible without being absurd. And then it scales all the other deflections. So apparently whatever the deformation in this arc of a circle is, it's very small compared to whatever that is. So one of the things I want you to notice is this very powerful tendency for the material near the quarter point or on the sides of the semicircular arch to bulge outward. And again, come back to this point that that is what stabilized these elements because the tendency to bulge in that direction is resisted by all this material in compression. And everything you can do to help keep this thing under the load is really crucial. Now, there are modern equivalents of that. Um, I did this diagram where we said, let's thicken it up here. This was for roll through deformation, but it also helps relative to this uh, deformation under um, uniform gravity loads. So here we have a sort of architectural expression of what something like that might look like. And here, Myers bridges. Um, now, we can carry all of that idea of, of inhibiting deformation a step further. So let's look at this ellipse, for example. Just like the semicircle, it's tending to collapse inward here or bulge downward and to bulge outward at these locations. Um, so the question becomes, if you think that this is a beautiful form, how can you make that work for you? So. I apologize for the quality of this image, but this is the Berlin train station, which I think has these beautiful elliptical shape. And by the way, these don't have to be exactly ellipses. We can do an arc of a circle here and an arc of a different circle up there and produce something that's almost identical, but structurally it's, it's still not satisfactory. So the question is, what did they do to stop the tendency to bulge inward here and bulge outward there? And this is the structural form that they used. So basically they said this part of this element, which we're going to call a would-be arch or a wannabe arch, is tending to bulge outward and fail in bending stress. So they basically took this sling and ran it about here and then they have a bunch of compression struts and those compression struts are pushing backward on that arch and inhibiting its tendency to bulge outward and likewise that tension element in essence continues except it comes inside up here where it's trying to 
inhibit the tendency of the center part of this ellipse to collapse downward. And it's pretty impressive that when you look at this, you can barely see those tensile elements. But you here, you see here one that's draped under there and is supporting this long section, which is much too shallow. Now, you might ar argue, and you could correctly, that this is no longer a true arch. It's more like a trust frame, and we're choosing to render the tensile parts of that trust frame in such a way that they almost disappear. So what we're left with is primarily this vision of these elliptical shapes, uh, which is, I think, what the designers wanted us to see. It's a beautiful example, though, where people really understand the nature of the moment diagrams that are going to incur, occur in these shapes under different loading conditions. And then they're responding by using the techniques that produce the visual effect that they want to have. That ends our video on funicular shape for an arch under a primary load. And again, we did an overview of common shapes for and I, again, I say they may not be arches the way they're used, but they're curvilinear elements or would-be arches. And those shapes are semicircle, arc of a circle, ellipse, catenary, and parabola. And as we go on, we'll explore the mathematics of all those uh, as we go along. And we'll also talk about what are the techniques for fabricating and producing those various shapes because that very often controls what we can actually do in this world is what we can make in a practical way.